Good morning, Mountain View Baptist Church. Welcome to worship today. As you can tell, I'm standing in the kitchen. I tell you what, this kitchen has been empty way too long. I can't wait till we can have a fellowship and have some food. I mean, after all, Baptists are known for their food, and, and that we're missing a whole element of being a Baptist by having to quarantine and stay away from each other. So I can't wait till the day we get to get back together and have some great food, and, and uh, that'll be a wonderful day. If you're joining us today for the first time, we welcome you as our guest today. Um, members, regular attenders, we welcome you back as well. Um, as, as we begin our worship service today, we always try to welcome you, give you a few few announcements. Remember, the website's updated with all the Bible studies online. There is one ladies' Bible study meeting on Monday nights here on campus. Uh, in, in regards to ladies, uh, I have not mentioned the Arise Conference uh, that's coming up in October. Uh, it'll be in Sedona, October, Sedona. That'd be a wonderful time to be up there. Uh, if you'd like more information about that, you can uh, talk to Diana Mercer, our church secretary. She has information on that. Ladies, you might want to go there. I know 15 of our ladies are already signed up, ready to go, and enjoy that weekend conference there. And uh, our, our um, focus this month for our uh, missions is the uh, ministry in... Uh, in Venezuela uh, with the Strong Tower Orphanage. And so I would encourage you to be praying for those uh, orphans and then also giving to this mission fund so that we can help support them as well. And then uh, as we mentioned last week, I want to mention again that September 6th it will be our first Sunday back in person. If you are not ready, we fully understand we will stay online from now on. You'll be able to worship with us that way. If you're ready to come, we will have the auditorium and the overflow over here as well. Um, and we'll, we have plenty of room to spread out. And uh, we are asking for social distancing and the masks and the protocols. We're trying to do all that we can to keep everybody safe. But we're ready to get back together and so we can worship some together in person for those who are ready for that. I will be out this week, uh, later this week, uh, in surgery. So I ask you to be praying for me. And I hope you have a wonderful week. Let me pray for us now as we get ready to transition to our time of worship and praise. Lord, again, thank you so much for this beautiful day you've given us. What a great opportunity to worship you and praise you, to recognize you for who you are. No matter what's going on in the world around us, you are God and you are God alone. May we praise you and worship you this morning as the one true God. We pray this in your name. Amen. Well, good morning, Mountain View Baptist Church. So glad to see you, sort of, again this morning. Welcome to worship today. Let's just lift our voices to our King today. Here we go. Our God will reign forever. And all the world will know His name. Everyone together, sing the song of the Redeemer lives, and now I stand on what He did. My Savior, my Savior lives. Every day a brand new chance to say, Jesus, You are the only way. My Savior, my Savior Sing it up. My Savior. 
more that will ever come close. No thing can compare. You're our living hope. Your presence, Lord. I've tasted and seen of the sweetest of loves Where my heart becomes free and my shame is undone Your presence, Lord That will ever come close No thing can compare You're our living hope Your presence, Lord I've tasted and seen Of the sweetest of love my heart becomes free and my shame is undone your presence Lord Holy Spirit you are welcome here come flood this place and fill the Come fly.
with everything that has been going on in the world around us I'm scared to even watch the news anymore to see what is happening and I heard this song um, that I'd known in the past and just really spoke to me um, talking about how we, we need to pray for God to come and intervene in our situation that he would he would open our eyes to what's happening around us and unlock our ears that we might hear what you have to say and so this song I think speaks to this very well I want to teach it to you today Lord hear our cry come heal our land breathe life into
Good morning again, church. So good to see you this morning. We're going to get back into God's Word in just a few moments. We're going to be looking at Judges chapter 3. But before we get in there, let me just say, uh, next Sunday, Pastor uh, David Payton, our worship pastor, will be bringing the message as I will be recovering from surgery. And so I'm uh, appreciative of David being ready to preach, and I look forward to hearing the message that God has with from him as well. So we're going to get back into Judges. We've, we've been in this series now for a couple of weeks. We're in chapter 3. Go ahead and get ready to, to look at those verses there. Verses 12 through 30 is what we're going to be looking at. Um, but, but we want to remind you just real quickly again what's going on here. Judges is one of the uh, darkest times in the history of Israel. Uh, th this time in, in Israel is very dark days, if you will. There's a cycle we talked about that keeps going on. And this cycle is they fall into sin, they fall into the bondage of sin, then they cry out to God, they supplicate out to God, and God sends a judge or a savior. And we see this cycle go on and on and on. It goes through all the way the book. And, and it's, it, it, remember that, that verse, there was no king in Israel and so every man did what was right in his own eyes. And that's what we're seeing happening. We, what we see is God's holiness and God's faithfulness. But then we also see Israel's unholiness and unfaithfulness. And the message to us today through this whole series, through the, all that we're going to look at, is that God wants us to be holy and to be faithful to him. Last week we looked at Othniel the Lion of God. And if you'll remember, uh, the, the Israelites had failed, and so they had fallen to the Canaanites. Uh, remember, they had not social distanced themselves. They had not spiritual distanced themselves from the Canaanites. And they compromised and fell into sin and into idolatry. And then they cry out to God, and God sends Othniel with the Spirit of the Lord. And he defeats the enemy and, and returns them back to the Lord, but they fall back into the same cycle again. And that's where we're going to pick up today in Judges chapter 3, verses 12 to 30. I'm going to read it in sections as we look at this, not all at one time. Uh, today we're going to look at Ehud versus Eglon. Uh, here's the title of the message, Lefty versus Hefty. All right, you'll see that in just a minute, and I know some of you will say, maybe that's not politically correct, but that's, that's the way it is. Uh, Ehud was a lefty, and Eglon the king, the evil king, was pretty hefty. And so that's the title for the message today. Let's look at it. Let's get into the first section, if you will, as we look at it, Israel's predicament. That's the first thing we see. What, what's the situation going on? That's verses 12 through 14. Listen as I read these verses. Once again, the Israelites did evil in the Lord's sight, and the Lord gave King Eglon of Moab control over Israel because of their evil. Eglon enlisted the Ammonites and the Amalekites as allies, and then he went out and defeated Israel, taking possession of Jericho, the city of Palms. And the Israelites served Eglon of Moab for 18 years. Years, So it, we see the cycle again. It's starting all over. Uh, they, uh, as long as Othniel was there, they were following God. When Othniel died, then they begin to follow their own way and do their own thing. And so they have fallen into sin against uh, God again. And, and God lets Eglon come on the scene. Eglon of Moab comes in, conquers them, enslaves them. And they serve him for 18 long years. And so uh, there's the second round of the cycle, if you will. Now, here's what's inter interesting about their enemy this time. The first thing is the enemy was related to them. Notice the three sections, the three groups, Moab, Moabites, Ammonites, and Amalekites. So the Amalekites were descendants from Esau. And if you'll remember, Esau was Jacob's twin brother. So they're a blood relative. The Moabites and the Ammonites were descendants of Lot. And if you'll remember, Lot was Abraham's nephew. So the reality is these three groups that come against Israel are actually their own 
relatives. They're related to them. But here's another thing about these three groups. They were groups or nations, if you will, that worshiped false gods. They did not worship Yahweh, the one true God. The Moabites served a God named Chemosh. The Ammonites worshiped a God named Moloch. And both of these gods, by the way, were worshiped with vile practices that included any, even things like child sacrifice. And then the Amalekites, they worshipped a variety of gods. They, they were a nomadic type people that traveled all over the place. So they kind of picked up gods wherever they were, their idolatry and their worship of different areas. And so these three nations worshipped false gods. And if you'll remember that first week, we talked about how the, the Canaanites would always be a thorn in the side for the Israelites. Well, that's exactly what these three nations were. They were a thorn in the side for Israel. They were always attacking them, always trying to enslave them, always enticing them to get off the path of God and to follow these other idols. And so they're always there. And yet they're related to them. Here's another thing to understand about this enemy. This enemy was very brutal to them. Uh, you, you see that first that they defeated them in battle. These three nations, they joined forces. So the King Eglon was pretty smart. He realized that he couldn't do it on his own. So he made these two other nations as allies and the three come against Israel and they defeat them. And that word in the passage there, defeated, really means to strike down. It's a very strong word, basically kind of to destroy. It's what the Israelites were supposed to do to all the Canaanites and the people that lived in the land. Well, that's the word that's used here. And the armies came and, and they did it. They weren't coming for some friendly picnic and hanging out with distant relatives. They were coming to destroy Israel. And Israel was in a fight for its very existence. And guess what? It lost. It lost the battle. Eglon established uh, his headquarters, it says in the passage there, in Jer uh, Jericho. And this is important. He did this on purpose because he's making a statement. The statement he's saying here is, I am in charge. I have beat the Israelites. I am in charge. If you'll remember, Jericho was the first city conquered by the Israelites when they entered into the promised land. And so Jericho represented uh, a victory, the first of the victories that would come that God would give to them. And so for one of their oppressors to come in and conquer them and set up headquarters right here in this very place w would have been really hard for them to take. And they knew he was making a statement. They were totally defeated and he was in control. But not only did Eglon defeat the Israelites, he also enslaved the Israelites. Um, because Israel failed to honor God and to follow God, they became servants. It says right there in that last verse I read that they served Eglon for 18 years. That word segla, or serve means to work or labor or to become a slave. It's a strong word. Israel was really supposed to serve the one true God and only the one true God. But now because of their failure and their sin and their compromise, they have become servants of Eglon for 18 years. Uh, let me just take a moment here and just say this. Our enemy today is not a nation. It's not a country. Our enemy today is Satan. That's his name. And I'll tell you, he's, he's a mighty man of, of war. And he comes as your enemy to enslave you into sin and to destroy your life. That is his whole purpose. That is our enemy. And by the way, he's very good at disguising himself. You know, I, I kind of look at it this way. Those three nations were blood relatives of the Israelites. They could have said, ah, we're coming for a good get together and then attack them. They could have disguised themselves in a way. Satan does a good job of doing that. He always likes to make something look and sound good and okay, but he knows in the end it will destroy you. It will enslave you and then destroy you. Uh, I want you to remember, uh, Christians, that we are in a spiritual war. We are in battle. This is, the Christian life is not a playground. It's a battleground. 
And I think many of you are sensing that and seeing that in today and the, some of the oppression you sensing around with what's happening in the world today. And we need to make sure we're ready for battle. I've said it both weeks before. I'll say it again. Ephesians 6, put on the full armor of God. You've got to put on the full armor of God. You can't let your guard down. You need to spend your time with God and his word and reading his word and staying away from those things that will destroy you, those things that will enslave you. And so this first part we see is Israel's predicament. They have failed the Lord and they've become slaves again to another country. The second part we want to look at today is Israel's defender. Uh, this will be verses 15 through 26. Again, we see that cycle. Israel comes into bondage, and they begin to cry out to the Lord. And, and because they cry out to the Lord, and the, the mercifulness of God, he begins that process to bring Israel back to himself. Listen to these verses. But when the people of Israel cried out to the Lord for help, the Lord again raised up a rescuer to save them. His name was Ehud, son of Gera, a left-handed man of the tribe of Benjamin. The Israelites sent Ehud to deliver their tribute money to King Eglon of Moab. So Ehud made a double-edged dagger or sword that was about a foot long, and he strapped it to his right thigh, keeping it hidden under his clothing. He brought the tribute money to Eglon, who was very fat. There's hefty, okay? After delivering the payment, Ehud started home with those who had helped carry the tribute. But when Ehud reached the stone idols near Gigal, he turned back. He came to Eglon and he said, I have a secret message for you. So the king commanded his servants, be quiet, and he sent them all out of the room. Ehud walked over to Eglon, who was sitting alone in the cool upstairs room. And Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. And King Eglon rose from his seat, and Ehud reached with his left hand, pulled out the dagger, strapped to his right thigh, and plunged it into the king's belly. The dagger went so deep that the handle disappeared beneath the king's fat. So Ehud did not pull the dagger out, and the king's bowels emptied. Then Ehud closed and locked the door of the room and escaped down the porch. And Ehud, after Ehud had gone, the king's servants returned and found the doors to the upstairs room locked. They, they thought he might be using the restroom, so they waited. But when the king didn't come out after a long delay, they became concerned and got a key. And when they opened the door, they found that their master was dead on the floor. While the servants were waiting, Ehud escaped, passing the stone idols on his way to Sierra. All right, I know that reading that passage, as some people would say, TMI, right? Too much information. But it's there. It's right there in Scripture. Every little gory detail is right there in Scripture. And, and I won't go into all the gory details, but that's the way God had it passed down to us. And Ehud kills Eglon, and there's the details of how he do, did it. So here's some interesting things about Ehud. Ehud was from the tribe of, of Benjamin. Benjamin's allotment of land included the land around Jericho. So therefore, their, their people, the Benjamite people, would be the ones suffering most under Eglon's reign. And so Ehud and the men of Benjamin, they had a lot of reasons for wanting to get rid of Eglon and his armies. And so it kind of sets a little bit of tone of the urgency for Ehud to be a part of this. But, but Ehud has a, a problem. He has a withered hand. He's a lefty. Now, I'll explain that in just a minute. You see, when it says Ehud was a left-handed man, there, there seems to be an understanding here that he was left-handed because there was something wrong with his right hand. Uh, some disagree about this, but more than likely, he had a withered hand or uh, uh, maybe did not have a right hand. And so, therefore, he was not able to use that and therefore was a left-handed man. Also interesting, though, that there were a lot of left-handed men from the tribe of Benjamin. Judges chapter 20, verse 16 mentions that. In fact, First Chronicles chapter 12, verse 2 also says that there were a lot of ambidextrous men in the Benjamite tribe. 
Don't know why, but interesting aspect. So when the Bible says that he's left-handed, it's not just meaning that he's left-handed like we think of left-handed. It's more than likely he was had to be left-handed because he was withered in his hand on the right hand. Crippled, if you will, would be another way to look at it, the word we could use. So he was forced to use his left hand um, to do things. Um, and this would seem like a handicap for that day and time. Uh, this would be considered a handicap. Uh, and it would also be considered a handicap for the, someone who would, would be the deliverer of the people of Israel. If the people were voting on who was going to be their deliverer, Ehud would not have won because he was handicapped, because he could not use his right hand. But anyway, God used him. God, God turned that liability, if you will, into a positive thing and used Ehud to bring deliverance. Now, I just want to say this for a second. Being left-handed is far from a handicap because I am left-handed. Pastor Jared's left-handed. And I know that many of the great minds in history and in the world today are left-handed as well. And so it's far from being a handicap. But in this story, in this understanding, that's the way they would have looked at it. I think Eglon had a problem as well. I think Eglon's problem was, was vanity. Um, some would say maybe it was his heftiness that he was large. I, I think really it was his vanity. So, so... Think of this, when, when Ehud comes back to him, he says, I have a secret message for you. And he kind of perks up and is like, oh, all right, you know, I, I'm a king, I get a secret message, I, I want that. It's something special just for me. And so he tells everybody else to get out so they can't hear it. And only he could hear that secret message. It, it's almost, it would remind me a little bit of those people who like to, to have that gossip tidbit, you know? And maybe he's thinking, oh, Ehud's coming back to tell me that there's an uprising somewhere in the Israelites or somewhere else, and I'll get to know what's going on. But he had a vanity to him that he's like, I, I need to know. It's that, that aspect of knowledge is power. And he says, I want that knowledge. I want that even if it's gossip. But then when he says it's a message from the Lord, then he even says, okay, I need to respect that. And he stands to get closer to hear that message. And that's when, that's when uh, Ehud kills him. Now, we see that Ehud had a problem. He had a handicap. But we also see that Ehud had a plan. Um, all along, his plan was to kill the king, to, to bring this uprising, to get rid of the evil king so that they could get close to God again. Um, the, I like the way they put this together. So every... Every so often, maybe once or twice a year, they, they were supposed to bring a tribute to King Eglon, and it, usually in the form of money. And so they sent their gift to Eglon via this delegation of Ehud. And Ehud, by the way, had taken the liberty to say, hmm, I'm going to try to do something here. And he, and he gets this dagger or this sword, attaches it to his right side, and again, he covers it up. And the guards would not have thought to check him, either because he's handicapped with withered hand, or because they're thinking, you know, he's left-handed, there's nothing he could do. Or they checked his left side, which would be where the sword normally would be, and found nothing. His plan was to get alone with that Eglon. And when he did, he was going to assassinate the king. It was quite a daring plan, because the reality is, if he got caught, he would have been killed at the moment. In fact, I, I kind of wonder, there's nowhere here in Scripture that says that anybody else knew about his plan. Did he do this on his own? Or did he do it with the whole group knowing what was going on? We're not told. I kind of think he did it on his own. But nonetheless, he's crippled. He's a withered hand. The guards just say, oh, let him go talk to him. No, no problem. He's not a threat. After delivering the, me the money and, and, and turning around to leave... It says that they gone a distance, and then Eg and Ehud says, hey, I need to go back. And he kind of sends the delegation on. This is kind of why I think it was a plan that he had uh, to do it by himself. But he says, you guys go on. I'm going to come back and say something to the king. And when he comes back to the king, of course, the, the Eglon wants to hear this secret message. So he closes the doors, sends everybody out. 
and that's when he takes the opportunity and he kills him. And he has victory. And he has victory because God was with him. I wonder, let me, before I go on to the next point, I, I think of, Eg, of Ehud, whether they knew the plan or not, whether he was doing it on his own, I, I kind of think in a way he was, it makes me wonder, would you and I stand up for the Lord if we were the only ones? Do we stand up today for the Lord even if others are not doing that? At school, at work, in our country, the morals and, and the word of God, do we stand up for what is right, for what is godly, even if nobody else does? I see that in Ehud. And then the kind of the last section is Israel's rescue, verses 27 to 30. Let's look at those verses. When he arrived in the hill country of Ephraim, Ehud sounded the call to arms. Then he led a band of Israelites down from the hills Follow me, he said, for the Lord has given you victory over Moab, your enemy. So they followed him, and the Israelites took control of the, of the shallow crossing of the Jordan River where it comes across from Moab, preventing anyone from crossing. They attacked the Moabites and killed about 10,000 of their strongest and most able-bodied warriors. Not one of them escaped. So Moab was conquered by Israel that day, and there was peace in the land for 80 years, a long, peaceful time. In this last part, the rescue, the, the rescue of Israel, a uh, <clears throat> couple of things I see here. First of all, we've got to follow the leader. So Ehud has now proven himself to be the leader. He kills the king. He sneaks out. He goes back to the, the place in the hill country there in Ephraim, and he sounds the alarm. He, he blows the ram's horn. Now, you need to remember, the trumpets uh, were, were only blown for certain reasons. Uh, some of the reasons were some great feat uh, had occurred. Uh, it was a signal to change locations. Uh, when they were moving through the wilderness, they would do that. Uh, it was blown to demonstrate joy and praise to the Lord. So that could have been it. It was also blown to call people to get their arms and go to war. And that was really the main purpose here. He who had come back, he had killed the king, and he says, we've started the battle, now it's time to finish the battle. And so were they going to follow him? God had, had heard the prayers of Israel. He had raised up the deliverer. He who had taken the first step towards that victory. He had killed the king and rallied the troops. The test was, would they follow him? Remember, again, he's, he's a handicapped man. He's, he's not the number one pick to be their leader. But he has proven himself already. And, and I wonder now today if there's not a test to see whether we're going to follow um, the Lord or not. Uh, so many times we, we have that choice on a daily basis. Will I follow what God says or am I going to follow what I want to do? Would they follow this leader that has now proven himself? And then the, the last part of this here is they've, they decide to follow him. They need to finish the battle. And so they surround, they, they come to, to Ehud, and they go down to the, to the river to cut off the main thoroughfare. And so they need to get down there. So there's no way of escape and no way for, for them to get out, the, the Moabites to get out and get away. And it says they even killed 10,000 of the strongest, mightiest men that they had. Um, wh what was the difference? Why couldn't they have done this a year before or two years before? Why did it take 18 years? Well, part of it was they needed a leader and God provided a leader, but they needed to follow the leader as well. They needed to say, okay, Ehud had shown himself, and now we need to follow him, and now we need to, to do this. But all of this, and, and it's not written here this time, but last time with Othniel it said because he had the Spirit of the Lord. And I think even without it being mentioned here, that's what we see. He has the Spirit of the Lord. And I want to kind of close this morning with, with this part of the story I think it's overlooked, but it's really important to me. And, and, and hear me well, I, I'm, I'm putting some of my thoughts into this 
but I, I want you to hear what I have to say about this. Look, if you go back to verse 19, it says, But when Ehud reached the stone idols near Gal Gigal, he turned back. So they had gone, presented the money to the king, and it, it, Ehud's probably thinking, okay, where's my opportunity? Where's my opportunity? It's not here. See you later, king. They start leaving, and he's thinking, okay, I wasn't supposed to do this after all. I was ready, but it wasn't the right time. And they're leaving, and they're going back, and it says, when he reached the stone idols, he turned back. He reached the idols. It's almost like he looks at those idols and says, I'm tired of serving these idols. I'm tired of serving a king who worships these idols. I'm tired of this because it's wrong. And he sends them on, but he turns back and he goes back and he does what he's supposed to do. He kills the king. And then in verse 26, listen, he's killed the king. He escapes. And then it says, while the servants are waiting, Ehud escaped, passing the stone idols on his way to Sirah. Not stopping at the stone idols, but passing. Why? What's the difference? Because he did what God called him to do. I, I, I want to close with this, and I want you to listen really carefully to me. Because I, got, I think God is speaking to us today about this. What are the stone idols in your life that are blocking you from walking right with God? Have you come to that place where it says, he turned back? Have you turned back to God? What, what is the compromise in your life that's messing everything up today? What is the sin in your life today where you are not right with God? And it's time to turn back from that stone idol. It's time to repent. That's what the word turn back means. It, it, repent is to turn back and come back to God. For some of you, it may be coming to God for the very first time. You've never repented of your sins. You've never given your life to Jesus. And today's the day to do that. For others of you, you have given your life to Jesus, but you are not following Jesus. You're following the stone idols. And you need to look those stone idols in the face, repent, and turn back, and follow Jesus. Will you pray with me this morning? Lord, I pray for anyone this morning who needs to give their life to you for the very first time, that in this very moment as they pray, they would do that. Lord, I pray for all of us who are your followers. If, if we aren't really following after you this morning, if we're following the stone idols, that we would turn back and then pass by them, running to your arms, open with forgiveness and love. Lord, I thank you for who you are, our Savior, our Lord, our King. May we follow you faithfully every single day. In Jesus' name, amen. And I would say to you this morning, that if you committed your life to Jesus for the very first time, let us know. Uh, there on the screen, there is a place, to, to a, a communication card or a prayer card. I, I can't remember exactly how it's worded, but let us know. Or if you need prayer, please let us know. We're here, not just to preach God's word, but to pray for one another and, and to help one another in this walk with the Lord. Turn away from the idols and follow him today. The Lord bless you this week.